thanks everybody for coming out. I appreciate uh, you guys wearing the face paint. <laughs> uh, uh, Justine, so uh, you know, my experience with, with journalism is, is uh, on the writing side. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your job entails and, um, and, then, and then tell us how you got interested in this topic. Okay, I work for ESPN, I work on off the field issues in sports. So not so much who won the game, but sort of the issues behind the scenes. A lot of crime in courts, a lot of drugs, um, both recreational and performance enhancing, um, a lot of corruption, cheating, things like that. Okay, and who, uh, who are your best sources? Who, well, who, who are all of your sources and, and where do most of your stories come from? <laughs> well, I'll tell you all the secret all of ones. Them. Well, you just hand me the, the um, spreadsheet. It, it totally depends on the story. I mean, the, what's really fun and also challenging about my job is one day I could be doing athletes in rehab and then the next day I can be doing like document research on employment records of, you know, athletes who may have gotten a free ride because they got no-show jobs at mm -hmm. some university. Um, so it just totally depends on the story. Um, good sources to tap are retired athletes who may have some perspective and may be in a position to talk about their experience with a little bit more mm -hmm. you know, honesty than people who are still totally involved in the game. In your in your day-to-day -day work, uh, how often are you coming into contact with uh, with fans? Are you do you have sort of a tip a tip line that people are are piping into, or or are you out there looking at what's happening in, in social media and? Well, I would say it totally depends because every story is different, every week is different. So, if I'm on a story that or an assignment that is taking me to events, I can't help but interact with fans. You know, if I'm d working for whatever reason at a ball game at AT&T Park, I'm on Muni with fans going to work and mm -hmm. going home. Um, but it sort of depends. I mean, a lot of my work doesn't in involve events. It sort of involves the backstory to events. Yeah. Um, but we have Twitter which is certainly the voice of the fan. So I think, you know, even with out being out and about, you can get a sense of what people are saying and thinking from mm -hmm. your couch. Let's talk about the, uh, about the book a little bit. Um, one, one interesting uh, facet of it is that it, it feels like there's a, there's a little bit of a difference between uh, U.S. fans and how they uh, relate to their their teams maybe and then and then European fans um, is there uh, is there there's something there uh, culturally that that uh, contributes to that or w what's your experience well I think that fandom plays out in different ways depending on culture depending on geography and demographics but there are some things that are sort of inherent to everyone and I talk about universality you know, you know, any time I sat there and tried to look for bad behavior, it was easy to find, just the way it played out was a little bit different. Everyone associates like crazy out of control extreme fans with soccer hooligans and soccer thugs in Europe. Right. Yes, that's one component of it that has certainly been covered and examined and written about. Mm -hmm. I think in the U.S. we sort of have our own incarnations of that. If you look at college football fans, for example, that's a religion. I and mean, there is a really strong passion that sometimes goes into overdrive and erupts into some pretty hideous behavior. Um, is there, uh, so do you feel like there's a, there is a difference between the, the college fan and the, the pro? team fan? I think so. I think so. Um, I mean, it sort of depends what type of events and what type of sports you're talking about. But you know, in all the interviews I've done promoting my book, everyone likes to ask me the exact same things. And one of the questions I get asked is, who are the worst fans? And, and well, that's not really what I address in my book. 
But, and I will tell you that everyone likes to say, you know, the worst fans are the fans of the team they hate. So if you're a <laughs> University of Michigan fan, God, those fans from Ohio State, they're just jerks. Or if you're a Detroit Red Wings fan, you know, those Chicago Blackhawk fans, you forget about them. So there's definitely like a little rivalry morality shift going on there. Uh -huh. um, but I think there's nothing like college football fans in this country. There's such a tradition. Mm -hmm. Like um, families revolve around it. I think part of it may be that you, yes, you have star players on a college football team or college basketball team, but really you're a fan of the school and the institution and what that school means to you and what the blue and white of Kentucky means and what their traditions and mascot and symbols mean to you. So that may make people relate a bit differently as well. So rather than ask you what the worst team is, um, because I, I know whatever team it is, it's from the New York area. Um, <laughs> I will ask you. What's what, your point, Josh? What, what's the uh, What's the worst sport? You see some pretty bad behavior in youth sports hmm. when it comes to parents who are the best, most committed fans of all, because it's their kids. Um, we've all heard like horror story after horror story about helicopter parents, Uber parents, overzealous parents, unruly parents, whatever you want to call it. There are a million things to call them, and what is probably really troubling more so about parents acting out on the sidelines is that what they're doing is teaching kids bad sportsmanship. So it's not like they're just acting in a vacuum and so they go to a San Diego Chargers game and they're a little drunk and belligerent. You know, when parents act out on the sidelines and display poor sportsmanship, of course kids are gonna internalize that. Mm -hmm. And what does that say for the kids themselves, the next generation of sports fans? Right, that's... Uh, so I, that might be the most insidious fan base because of it. That's, that makes a lot of sense. I coached uh, my son's under nine lacrosse team. Are you an obnoxious team. parent? You can admit it. No, I was a coach, okay. so I, I Did the parents the, pick on you? They didn't, but it, it, uh, the, the times that... Uh, that they would ask me pointed questions from about 75 yards away. It was, a, <laughs> it was kind of disturbing. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and that is something sure. I hear over and over again. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, uh, in fan activity on the, on the lighter side of things, like uh, pranks. Um, do, do, are, there any, are there any great prank stories that, uh, that you came across in your, in your research? Well, I spend a chapter on student sections, and that's sort of a unique element to college fans. You know, in at a big sports school, be it college basketball or college football, there's a area of the stands set aside for students, known as the student section. They get cheaper tickets, they all get to sit together and be loud and do coordinated things. Um, so I spent time in various student sections during college basketball season with these student groups. And they were, you know, and they're there and they cheer on their team and they're clever and they're funny and then sometimes they are totally over the top and obnoxious and say terrible things. Um, and then the question becomes, how do universities control what they're saying? These are public institutions. Uh, the kids are pretty much permitted to say what they want um, through free speech, right. but it's certainly not really making the university um, look very good. I'll tell you one story. It's from a while ago, but there's a Bay Area connection. A couple years ago at, the, at Cal, the student section decided to prank a USC player. And what happened was, this was like right at the birth of the internet, basically. This one guy started IMing um, the player and was posing as a woman named Victoria and was flirting with him and was setting up a date for post game. Well, when this player got to Cal and got to the arena, all of a sudden the student section 
started chanting, Victoria, Victoria. And the guy was like, oh my god, what's going on? Was totally thrown off his game. And so in the book, I tracked down the perpetrator of this prank. Um, his name's Steve, but we still like to refer to him as Victoria. Um, and he actually <laughs> lives in the Bay Area. I don't know why he's not even here tonight. Um, all right, so we're, this is a, a little bit on the lighter side, but <coughs> what, are, uh, what are some of the, the, the worst examples of destructive uh, you know, mayhem that, uh, that you came across? Well, they are not hard to find. Um, I will take you to, there's one chapter in the book where I sort of examine three big events that all sort of happened at the same time a little bit um, and were really significant sort of in the high profile professional sports world. First was looking at what happened with Brian Stowe, the, Do the San Francisco Giants fan who was at Dodger Stadium opening day and was beaten in the parking lot. Um, and it was just an event that grabbed national headlines and got everyone talking about, oh my God, what's wrong with sports fans? And he was beaten within inches of his life. And he's made a remarkable comeback. You guys may be familiar with seeing him throw out the first pitch now at Giants games. And he's still, his life is forever changed. Mm -hmm. He's brain damaged. He's completely dependent. Um, but there was a point where they didn't know if he would live or die. Right. Um, the other two things I talk about in that sort of pivotal chapter is one, the 2011 football season, another Bay Area um, incident, that preseason game where the Raiders played at Candlestick and there were all those fights in the parking lot and two people were shot and it was just chaos. And that's sort of, got not only the Bay Area teams to revamp some of their security practices, but also the entire National Football League said, we need to clean up our act a, li act a little bit. And certain rules were put into place, uh, changes about bringing your bags into the stadium so you can't hide booze, you can't hide weapons. And some of that is security in relation to terrorist threats, but some of it is security in relation to bad fan behavior. Mm -hmm. And then the other component in that chapter is a little farther back. Uh, in 2004, there was an event uh, sort of called Malice at the Palace when the Pacers and Pistons, two NBA teams, were playing and players, it just was this free for all where players went into the stands after fans and fans were throwing drinks on the players and it was another thing that captured national headline and headlines and made people reevaluate uh, fan behavior, the relationship of players and fans, security, the NBA changed some of their security policies because of that incident and a league like the NBA has a situation where their fans are right on the court, right there. What is it? I mean, what is it that happens to uh, a fan where they, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there's not just this incredibly violent segment of the population, you know, outside of sports that just happens to, to, to be at the game every time. I mean, are, are these folks that are getting into... Some people would like you to think that, actually. Yeah. Like, you hear a lot of police chiefs say, oh, it's not our fans, or oh, it's just a couple of bad actors, mm -hmm. which seems to me like an excuse, but I totally well, interrupted your question. No, so go ahead. Well, that's, that's where I'm kind of going with it. it these, I suspect that these people are fairly non-felonious uh, uh, in their Good daily word. lives, right? When they, you know, the, most of the week, they're, they're probably at least decent and neutral, um, people not breaking the law and, and hurting other people. What is it that happens on game day um, you know, at the mental level, at the physiological level, that that turns r seemingly regular people into into uh, really bad fans. <laughs> well, what I took away from my research was that often sports can create this perfect storm. You have this terribly stimulating event with lights, with heat, with maybe you have 
fireworks, you have lots of people close together. There's like a physical component to being there and being in a crowd. There's also research that shows that if you're watching violent, aggressive behavior, you may emulate that violent behavior. There's research that shows how people kind of get jacked up mm. from watching sporting events. Um, you know, people are so emotional when it comes to their team. They invest so much of their identity, and it's those people, the highly identified, who are shown to be more prevalent to act out and engage in bizarre and sometimes abusive behaviors. So it's sort of like this marketing conundrum because the more you love the team, the more potential you have to act out. And if you're you know, a team owner, what do you do? Because those are the people you want. Those you want to Yeah, you want to nurture those fans, but if they're the people right. with the potential to act like jerk, jerks and destroy your sta stadium, that's not a great combination. Well, I, I will uh, make sure that as we build our software system, we, we stop below the, the criminal uh, <laughs> inspiration level. Yeah, let me know how you figure out that yeah, algorithm. We, exactly. Um, all right, so, so you've got this, uh, this transformation uh, that's taken place on, on game day. Um, what about different security approaches that uh, the, the teams are taking, the stadiums are taking to, uh, to, to try to, I mean, how do you deal with that? I, you mentioned there's, there's the legal side, but there's the also in the moment on the ground, you got your security guards and the your fight could break out anywhere. How, did, how are uh, teams coping with that? Well, it's really hard because as you said, it's a conundrum. You don't want to, you want to nurture your fans. You don't want to let them think they're in a police state and every you know, single move is being watched. But in fact, every single move is being watched with the amount of closed circuit cameras there are today in the stadiums. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a challenge. Um, another challenge to the security front is how much it costs. It's not sexy. It's not going to make you money back to invest in security. It's the thing that the owner doesn't want to hear, hey, we need to hire more security guards. Hey, we need to hire more off-duty police officers, because that costs money. Right. Um, and it's a challenge. Um, there's also different security approaches, and you know, less is more security, or is more is more. Like here in the United States, you generally don't see security in riot gear at sporting events. You know, there may be a big event where there are some officers in riot gear staged off to the side of things for post game. Some horses. Yeah, but you're not gonna generally see them up front because mm -hmm. that may instigate and sort of set up an expectation that, hey, you're supposed to riot. <laughs> Um, but I went to a soccer game in Mexico a couple months ago, and it was sort of a middling event in a regular season, nothing huge at stake. It was not sold out by any means. Police in riot gear everywhere. In the, the city here, when the Giants won the, you know, won the World Series last Each time. time. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, the first thing that, uh, that that played on the news, you know, after the after that Giants win thing, you know, first thing you see is a, is a couch being burned. What's with couches? <laughs> what, why do people? It, it's a very good question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer. I do <laughs> know that certain college towns have literally passed laws saying no furniture allowed on porches, like no indoor furniture allowed on porches in the name of not having furniture out there that you can burn. And here it's sort of weird to think about that people just spontaneously came up with a couch to burn. But in college towns, <laughs> you know, there are crappy couches on porches. I've had people tell me that college students go to Goodwills and said, you know, you got a $25 couch. Um, and it's not only couches, it's mattresses too. Weird. Yeah. That is so strange. <laughs> well, um, Going a little bit deeper than just that 
that burning couch on the street. What, uh, what is it about winning something that, I mean, you, you'd think that your team wins, everybody's happy, you know, congratulating each other, maybe yelling a little bit and, uh, you know, and, and having fun and being happy. What is it? <laughs> Why that, does that shift? Yeah, what, what flips the switch there? What, 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 what's yeah, going on? I say in the book, like, if you get a great Christmas present, you don't go and burn down your Christmas tree. It sort of just doesn't <laughs> follow. But um, they say there's a hormonal reason, actually, that if your team wins, your testosterone rises. And so you're celebrating winning, and you may be, you know, inclined to be more aggressive. What the? What about the the internet and social media? Um, you know, changing the way that fans behave and misbehave. Uh, what are some of the, the the big points there? The internet now allows you to reach out directly to the athletes that you are a fan of. Um, it's you know you can tweet at a fan. I mean, you can tweet at an athlete and say, you're my guy. Or you can say some nasty things. Um, it allows fans to connect directly with other fans. Uh, I mentioned this in the book. I know of two Boston Red Sox fans who met on Twitter and got married. They started nice. with the Red Sox in common. It turns out they had a lot more in common. Yeah. So there are really connective moments. And then, of course, there's some really disconnected moments where it's really easy to be anonymous and nasty and pile on. Mm -hmm. Is there, uh, is there a, an element of, so, so kind of what you're talking about is this, uh, you know, with what happened with, the, with Buckeye Nation and, uh, and some of the other stuff in the, in the book, there's this kind of almost vigilante-ish vibe to it. But, uh, on the on the other side of that, I guess there's a there there was someone I think in a, in Vancouver, who kind of turned it around, and used uh, social media to sort of attack to go after people who had been rioters. Well, social media now is a tool that security officials use, and in the Vancouver Stanley Cup riots, for example. Authorities comb through hours and hours and hours of footage to get visuals of the rioters and figure out who they were and track them down. Mm -hmm. And one component of that was locals got involved and sent stuff in. Mm -hmm. And some other individuals actually compiled websites that would do that, and then they would turn it over to the police. Huh. So, you know, if you're in a big crowd of young people who start out celebrating an event, there are going to be a heck of a lot of selfies taken. You know? yeah. <laughs> and I saw that after the Golden State Warriors won the NBA Finals. I went out to the mission, and I was checking out you know, what the crowds were doing. Everyone was wondering, are they going to riot? This is the hot spot where people riot after the World Series victories. Where couches go to die. Where couches go to die, where people go to throw tortillas. That was a big thing. <laughs> This year, people were throwing tortillas at the corner of 16th and Mission. All right. Um, but yeah, everyone <laughs> has a camera. I mean, I was up there with Periscope. I was doing it, too. So there's tons of social media generated in an event like that, and it can be a tool for security. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you uh, come across any security systems that, that have software going through uh, the, the closed circuit stuff on, on people coming into the stadium? Oh, you mean like facial recognition yeah. stuff? Um, I spent time with an entrepreneur and security expert who was sort of test driving a security system for sporting events. And what that system, it was called, it is called IBIS II, mm -hmm. um, was an integrated security system that paired up facial recognition and license plate readers. So if you were coming to a sporting event, they would check out your car and your license plate, that's assuming you're driving to the event, um, and see if you were on any bad guy lists, you know, be it a warrant out for your arrest, a no-fly list, whatever database they were working with. 
Um, and then there was a facial recognition component. There were cameras all around. This was at a polo match I was actually at. They did a beta test at a polo match in Scottsdale, Arizona. Yeah, because there are a lot of bad actors. Hooligans at the <laughs> polo match. Well, there were a lot of it. drunks there. Uh. There was a lot of drinking. <laughs> um, so they would run your face upon entry, I believe, through this facial recognition system and see if you matched up you know, any of their photo databases, again, that were, you know, is there a warrant on this person? Are they on a terrorist list? Did Things the, like that. Did the fans, uh, did they know that they were being uh, screened that way? I think there's a picture of it on my website, but yeah. I don't remember the exact wording off the top of my head. So, th so there was some note, I, I, I'm just curious uh, as to the, uh, what did they call it, the um, <coughs> panopticon. Uh, effect, right, where if people know that they're being watched, then they tend to behave, or if they think right. they're being watched, then they tend to behave better. Well, there are all sorts of civil liberties issues with the system mm -hmm. like this, or concerns, but I think the people behind it do feel like they're actually on safe, you know, legal ground. Mm -hmm. And I've heard from more and more people that facial recognition is an area that stadium security people would like to go into. And when I was at that conference in Orlando, there were, there were a lot of security devices like that on display. Like you would walk past one part of a, in the hallway at the convention, and then later on you would see yourself on videotape somewhere else, and they would run you through a database. Hmm. Wow. So and they would come and arrest you. <laughs> Just a tap on the shoulder. Uh, we got You're you gone. for those parking tickets that you <laughs> never paid. Um, you know, having done all this research, gone through uh, what you went through, um, what do you uh, a kind of predict? Is you know, are there any any big sort of shifts uh, coming up, or any big uh, technological developments that'll change things? And what do you hope will happen? As someone who who loves sports, what would you like to see? Well, in answer to your first question, I think in the next decade maybe, we will see the way we enter stadiums completely change. And that will be defined by technology. So right now, if you go to a big sporting event, you're going through some security, you're going through those things, mm -hmm. um, you're being scanned. Um, I think that will continue to get more and more high tech. And, and they would like it to become less obtrusive. So you just walk through a field, and you don't know you're being scanned, but you are, mm -hmm. that type of thing. OK. Um, and the second question was, what do what I hope like to, to see? see? Yeah, seeing, oh. I mean, spending so much time kind of, you know, wading through all this awful uh, mayhem and, and misbehavior. I'd like to see, rather than only technological, steps address the symptoms, I'd like to see something more core taking place. And I actually wrote an essay about this that was published on CNN today. I'd like to see different constitu constituencies in sports come together to sort of reshape the culture <laughs> and emphasize better sportsmanship and more civility. And I think if you do that, at a youth sports level, in terms of we were talking a little bit before about parents, mm -hmm. parents being bad influence on the next <laughs> generation of sports fans, um, you may be able to affect change if you start early. So it's it's uh, sort of programs that are woven into into little league sports mm -hmm. at the youth level, mm -hmm. and and I, I'm guessing and, and uh, hoping that, that it focuses a lot on the parents <laughs> and a little bit on the kids too, but uh, I think... Uh, I think know. that's where you might be able to really make a shift. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, well, so thanks a, a ton for, uh, for, for taking the time and for writing such a fascinating book. Do we need to wrap up? Yeah, I gotta wrap up. So let's right. hear it for Justine and John.
to, and Justine's happy to sign copies of the book. And in fact, I'm happy to take more informal questions in back.